all of these clients, all of these experiences, all of these techniques that I've picked up it eventually began to lead to this really big project that was then upcoming and on the horizon. So uh, this has been your latest project. Yeah. You've just, we mentioned it at the start of this episode, but you've just completed your first full length feature documentary. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell me all about that? Because it's a fascinating story and it's not a five minute job. It's taken you the last year and a half to, to start filming it to probably the last year in the editing suite. And yeah. then now it's finally done. It's finally done. It it doesn't make sense that it's that we're now talking about it in past tense because it's just been such a long Something never that was ending- gonna happen for so long. <sighs> never-ending undertaking but um yeah so uh the documentary is of course through the acc once again um and that's what i love is just this symbolic full circle kind of moment of you know my first feature length film could have been about anything with anyone and it just so happened to be with these guys again and so that has really meant so much to me and I'll never forget. But um, I mentioned when talking about the ACC that one of the things that they do infrequently is a concert, a combined schools concert at Hamer Hall. And um, while I was working for them uh, across the 10 year period, I had the opportunity to be present at two of these concerts one in 2014 and one in 2018. Um, the 2014 completely freaked me out because I was, you know, 15, 16 by that point and being asked to film this humongous event uh, with six, 700 plus students that are participating on top of all the staff that are there as well. Um, I was, I saw it as a great opportunity, but like it was far beyond me. So, um, but that made a uh, a behind the scenes video that's on their channel as well. Um, I refuse to watch it. And uh, also a, a 2018 uh, video, uh, just a, a repeat of that process. Um, before I get into like the filmmaking side of things, it's important to mention like what it's about. So ACC run this concert and it's called Accent on Music. Um, and essentially what it is, is all 13 schools participating in this big event where they make up multiple ensembles, which can be a drum line, it can be a guitar ensemble, 90-piece orchestras, senior stage band, a jazz band, um, and they perform together uh, in this one-and-a-half-hour show in front of a two-and-a-half-thousand-seat theatre. And at Hamer Hall. At Melbourne. Hamer Hall, you know, the, the premier venue of, of Melbourne, you know, there's there's really no other prestigious venue other than maybe the Palais or the Art Centre and that's it. You know, Hamer Hall, when you play there, you've you've made it. <laughs> so I guess that that's what's so unique about the concert too, is it's actually the schools coming together and performing together. But with that, which is kind of what the documentary is about essentially, is the collaborative process and how you coordinate um, all the school, all the students coming together and all the logistics that go into creating this concept. But somehow you get these six, 700 kids in the hall in front of a couple of thousand people and they perform amazing music together. Yeah. So the documentary features how you break down all of the multiple layers that you have to tick off in order for the show to be smooth and successful. And a lot of that is headed up by the production team that actually put the concert together and Paddy himself, because I've mentioned it, you know, before at the premiere, but he is like the Excel spreadsheet God um, of organization. And so uh, when you have an event of that magnitude that Paddy is organizing, you have faith that it's going to work because he's just, brilliant at it but yeah so the 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 story unfolds how all these students are meeting each other for the first time 
and then all of a sudden playing together. Because that's really important to understand is that these schools are not getting up there and presenting their own individual item on stage. It's not right. Okay, St. Bernard's College, you're next. And then it's uh, Salesian's College. That's not how it works. It's actually a handful of students from each school mixed together in these bands that then form this ensemble. And that's where the challenges arise because this, this organization somehow has to pull together all these rehearsals, all these schedules, so that everyone can get in the one room at the one time to practice. And because it's 13 schools you're dealing with, there's very limited amount of opportunities to actually have these rehearsals. So for one ensemble, they may only get two, max three chances to rehearse together, and then they're on stage. And that's where I was like, got to make a documentary about this. This is like too good to pass up because um, there's, there's so the, the stakes are incredibly high there. And, um, and you're dealing with students that are 13 to 17 years old where they're at the beginning of their music uh, experience. And so naturally, you know, there are ensembles there that are not going to sound like, Hans Zimmer worthy or John Williams, you know, there's going to be some little, you know, ropey moments there, but the parents appreciate the fact that they're up there at all in front of so many faces, giving it a go. So, um, so yeah, so that's what the documentary is about, but, uh, more specifically, because there's a, a lot of ensembles that feature in it, I had to narrow down and choose a few storylines. And so uh, through the experience of filming it, I eventually chose three ensembles to follow. Uh, a junior choir group, a drumline ensemble, and a senior stage band, which is kind of like a, a jazz band as well. Um, and So why did you pick those three? Those three were picked because they, uh, for, for multiple reasons, the main one being they are all musically very different from each other. Um, drumline has that very military grade, grabs you by the throat, aggressiveness, and the minute they start playing, you are hooked. They're, they're, the, first, um, they're the first ensemble that I show in the film. Um, and uh, as you know, because you've seen it, uh, they did it flawlessly. Um, and that, that was headed up by a really, you know, really entertaining uh, a conductor as well, who had a lot of exp uh, experience in drumline. Um, the the junior choir has the heart and soul. It has the emotion to it because the piece that they played was just really heartwarming and and very soft. And it it just it I I could even see the conductor down the front of the cinema, you know, it, you know, wiping away a few tears here and there. Yeah, I was sitting right behind her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, but and uh, and plus, you know, a few others, you know, around me, you know, when when it's kids, you know, you can't help but feel that pride. Um, and so so that was really beautiful. And then the senior stage band, they that was the funky party piece that rounds off all those three ensembles quite perfectly with a you know with a bow and um and the conductor especially he he was a, a a he was instrumental to choosing that part in the pun he was instrumental to choosing that ensemble because he just has this energy about him and his humor really cuts across as well but also the music in that group was so bloody good. Yeah, they were they were the best group. They were by far the best. I I feel a bit like an imbecile because I had underestimated what these students were capable of, um, what those two drummers were capable of. Because for for listeners, the senior stage band um, has two drummers that are uh, kind of battling it out together through the through the piece that they are playing, and both of them are, are rock solid. Um, they understand timing. They understand tempo. They they understand you know notation uh, when it came to reading the music um, and and but also uh, technique and textures when it came to uh, you know 
how hard or how soft the the clarinets and the the trumpets had to play and the trombones as well. So um, it just amazed me how good they were and how like well, they they're not even graduated yet. And look, I, I like I seriously hope that they pursue it. Somehow, yeah. even if it's just a side hustle after school as well. The talent was real, and I, because I actually helped you film on the day of the concert, mm-hmm. which we filmed for what, like, seventeen hours or something stupid. Yeah, something like that. We had to get there super early, film all the kids calm. Yeah. Um, and we were just running back and forth all day, just capturing as much as we could. Yeah. But during the performances, as well, we kind of limit. We filmed some dress rehearsals. That's how we were able to capture some of those close up up shots. Yep. Um. But during the performance, you were sort of roaming in the crowd and I was on the just in the wing on the stage. But I remember the drummers in particular, when they're doing the battle back and forth with one another, like they're just absolutely in their element, going, just yeah. going ham at it. Yeah. And like they were phenomenal. I'd love to go see them like if they're in hopefully they pursue it and end up being rock stars or I hope something. So. Yeah, oh, yeah. I hope so as well. And the thing that doesn't make sense that that off stage they are so quiet and so shy and and really kind of reserved, but by the time they get out there, maybe it's just like years of bottled up rage mm. <laughs> or or school stress of studies and exams so that's just like this is their one and only opportunity to let it out uh, and yet they let it out with such perfection and uh, precise uh, playing as well. Um, Which, thank goodness that all the music came together on the night because it would yeah. be pretty difficult to create a compelling story if you get build it all up to the end and then eh, 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 it yep. just sounds like yep. crap. Yeah. But the, the students did a phenomenal job and they really pulled through. Yeah, which was amazing. totally. And look, you know, there's without sharing too much detail because I don't want my uh, audience to know, but like there's, there's moments in, you know, certain performances where like there was a few musical car crashes and some <laughs> some moments where kids didn't come in on time or whatnot. Now, naturally, you edit those out, but um, because you want your audience to be engaged, but I, like the, the, the point that we're trying to make here is that it's not necessarily about the mistakes that they make. It's just the fact that they're up there at all having a go because- would I have the guts to go out there and play piano in front of a two and a half thousand seat theater? I don't know, man. I really don't know. And um, I think it helps that it was in a collaborative sense, you know, a we're a, like a, a we're all in this together sort of thing, and that helps ease the nerves. Um, but somehow they they just pulled through. So they did uh, a terrific job. Yeah, I'm really curious to know. Like, why did you decide that this was going to be a documentary? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, you could have just made it a short 10, 15-minute video just to recap, you know, the process of the students getting together, practicing, and then the final concert. I think back to what I did for the 2018 one. So the 2018 uh, project was a 12-minute video, and that showcased the rehearsals, and the performances. I remember that experience being like, I'm really having to, I'm really having to force myself to squeeze down a lot of stuff into this finite amount of time. Um, I'd love to be able to give a lot more breathing space that it deserves. Um, let's take the interviews, for example. Um, with the staff and the students, that was a case of pulling them aside during the rehearsals and only having an opportunity to ask them maybe two or three questions and that's it. Um, I remember doing that and feeling quite intrusive and invasive doing that. And like, I'm, I'm having to pull them away from doing something that's really important. Like they should be there focusing on what they need to do. Mm. And the last thing they feel like doing is, Oh, I have to be on camera now. Um, as opposed to, and also like we're, you're filming interviews in environments in which you can't control the space as well. So it made more sense to schedule a time where for one thing, I can ask more questions. We can get deep in the weeds about the the logistics of putting a show like this together. Um, but also because I can control the lighting, I can control the sound and, and make it look as cinematic as possible with where I place the cameras. Um, so that's, for, that's more a, me- a mechanics point of view. 
from a story point of view, um, I just felt like more needed to be said and more needed to be acknowledged about how hard it is to put this together. And you can't do that justice with just a 12 minute video. I mean, I suppose you can, but in the way that I perceived it, I just felt like you couldn't do that. So um, I also wanted to incorporate all these mini storylines that were taking place and somehow bring full circle to it. So in the 2018 video, there is one boy that by sheer chance, not because I did it deliberately, but somehow I managed to link, you know, him at the very first rehearsal all the way to the, to the very concert. And I looked at that and went, Oh, that's a nice kind of thread. You get to see him at the very start and at the very end. And it happened purely by accident. And so I looked at that and went, I'd love, to see more of that. I want to see more storylines. I want to see how kids grow in the process of practicing their instrument, practicing their piece, and then eventually performing it. And so those little thoughts were bubbling away and that eventually led to me wanting to pitch this idea to both Paddy and his assistant Dominic, um, of which I did in February of 2020. I developed a PowerPoint. I showed them uh, the visuals of uh, what we did in 2018. And I showed him some mock designs of what I was wanting to do for this one. Um, in terms of length, I anticipated it being 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes max. Um, I wasn't really, you know, in it for this huge feature length motion picture. Um, so, that's important to remember. Like that was never on the cards, and um, but I knew that this was going to be a big undertaking, nonetheless. And because because of that reality that there was going to be a lot of work involved, I didn't receive a green light straight away, and that actually took me by surprise. I was I was actually because Paddy, you know, I developed such a really strong relationship with him. I I assumed it would just be okay, yes, okay for everything that I do for him, but. I'd actually appreciate the fact that he knew where to stand his ground and to go, oh, hold on a minute. This is, we're entering into new territory here. We just need to think a bit more about this because this is, this is big. Um, and so we thought a little bit more about it, but then the inevitable happened and we were in a pandemic and then we had to shelve, they had to postpone their concert. It was going to take place in 2020 mm, and then they true. had to postpone it for two years now, therefore, my project had to be postponed as well. Um, but then eventually we revisited it and uh, we were still stuck in this uh, unknown apprehension that Paddy was experiencing um, and also that I was feeling as well. You know, I didn't know how this was going to turn out, um, but I was I was keen to <laughs> to even go as far as fighting him for it because, like, it's one of those things where... You see it in your head, and if they don't see it, your job is to not be impolite and force it down their throat. You have to coach them through it. And to, get them to see it. And get them to see it and, and just just talk it through. You Use use the appropriate language. Um, but if words don't communicate that, then show it. And I did. So what I did, I said to him, okay, here's the deal. Let me show you what one interview would look like, what I plan for an interview to how I would scope it out. And uh, by this point, we were three rehearsals in and there was still no interviews had been shot yet. So, you know, time's ticking away. But you'd still been capturing I'd still rehearsals. like, yeah, the rehearsals, uh, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a non-negotiable. I just had to turn up to those anyway. So um, there was really no big kind of like cut the ribbon and production begins. It was just... Turn up to the first yeah, day of rehearsal. Yeah, video guy, get in there. Yeah, th that's it. Curtis, jump in. Um, really, that ribbon cut moment was when Paddy looked at the interview that I'd set up for one of the staff members, and right then and there, I got the green light, and he said, "Yep, yeah, go right ahead. I see what you're doing now. I un I get it." Um, and uh, and then we were off to the races, and we and we. <laughs> there was a lot of interviews to do though, and that probably I didn't uh, anticipate properly because you did eighty three in the end. Eighty three all up. It was twenty seven staff, and then 
whatever the, the remainder is for the amount of students that I had to uh, capture as well. Um, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a to lot. Undertake. So I had to visit all 13 schools and uh, and some were, you know, based out, you know, I'm based in North Melbourne, so some were based out in Geelong. There was a school in Ballarat as well. There's uh, Ferntree Gully. There's Malvern, Mulgrave, uh, Essendon, Bundura. There's just like, I was moving around a lot. Um, and then, of course, Hamer Hall in, in the in the city. So shooting was very heavy going, but as I mentioned at the premiere, I actually really enjoyed it. You know, like, well, I guess because you're there, you get to you're there as everything's starting to unfold. You're yeah. there as the the kids are practicing, and you get those interview clips as well, and you start to you know get in their heads and the minds of what the, the students are feeling. Yeah, and all that. I think um, I do remember though, there were two particular days of filming where I thought this was going to go pear-shaped. Um, the first one, <laughs> the first interviews that I did with uh, students um, was uh, St. Mary's College and the first two boys that came up, um, they were just terrible <laughs> they were so bad well, it's, it's such a hard uh, thing like yeah. it's a hard thing just conducting an interview with anyone yeah. let alone kids where you know a lot of them are probably shy and not yes. willing to share yep. and just not even well spoken yeah. really oh yeah and look, haven't and developed those skills yet and how those interviews turned out like half of that is purely because that of, of my you know lack of preparing for that reality and and not having the techniques down pat by that point to coach them through it and to get comfortable in front of the camera. But those were the very first students that I interviewed and I've still got all these other schools to go and I'm sitting there going, is this what I'm in for, for the whole production? Mm -hmm. Am I just going to get these one word unenthusiastic answers? Um, but thankfully <laughs> that, that was just for that school. Um, well, I, I, actually, no, there, there were some other students that weren't, you know, great either, but, yeah, um, of course that's just the individual. Re yeah. But I think it's interesting because, well, I've, I have seen the film. I, yeah. I was lucky enough to actually get an invite to the premiere. You did. But I think what made the film, one of the aspects that made the film so great was how very quickly you'd have you know, both the staff and the students just with their interviews, you got straight away just about you would get a strong sense of their personality and what sort of character they played mm. in the film. And it was really amazing to see just the, the yeah, the story arcs of each of the characters that we followed. Obviously you can't follow six hundred students, but you picked out different ones from the three different ensembles that you mentioned earlier. And you could really just see their progression and you just laid it with all these different personalities that really came together and made a super dynamic and engaging film in the end. I'm glad you say that because for anyone that watches the film when it eventually comes out, um, I, <laughs> I, I had to, you know, reinforce this point to the staff that were there at the premiere. When you watch it, it looks like it was really efficiently planned out and really scripted out. But, but that, people don't see the that was back end not of the case. all the... Thousands of, well, not thousands, when hundreds I, of hours of footage that you've eliminated and chosen just the very best parts. When I say it was a make it up as we go along process, like that doesn't justify what took place in production to find those storylines and how much a lot of that was decided in the editing process. Um, and let's like take those three storylines that I followed, for example. A lot of those weren't decided until halfway through filming or sometimes even until I sat down and started editing. Um, I was actually originally going to follow five storylines, um, but I compromised on two of them. One, because the film was going to be too long, uh, but also because three is a nice kind of round number. A lot of things come in threes. So uh, yeah. that, that was a nice comfortable uh, choice. But um, yeah, a lot of decisions were made in post-production because there are really two types of documentaries. There's one where it covers a subject matter that took place in the past 
And so as a historical event, maybe. And so all of the materials already exist. It's just up to the filmmaker to uncover those materials, find them, and then piece it together in their own way. The second type of documentary is when it covers a subject that is developing as the movie is being made. So there is no way of knowing what is going to eventuate in the storyline, what comes to fruition, what, yeah. And so you can't, you uh, you actually have no way of scripting this prior to filming. Now, you can guide where you want it to go based on the questions you ask in the interviews, but an interviewee may bring up a point that you are unaware about that you may want to know more about. And so you follow up on it and a new idea is born. And so then that changes your trajectory, depending on where in the production you are, of how you film the next little rehearsals. Because, you know, this teacher said that this student is doing this, you know, part in the song, because I now have that information available to me, I now know to look out for that student at the next rehearsal because that teacher has mentioned it in on camera and I can link that with the B-roll that I shoot at the rehearsal. So, but I'm having to think like this on a monumental level because I've got freaking 27 staff that have mentioned all, like, it, it's an overflow of information that I have to keep track of. So I had a production Bible Excel spreadsheet to just note everything down, keep 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 track of all the storylines <laughs> that I needed to follow. Um, it, when it came to the students, so I've obviously got the three ensembles, but when it came to the students, I think there's maybe, oh, there could be 10 to 15 that appear every now and again in the film that all have their own kind of little storyline threads and- and each and every single one of them, you know, you have to, I had to look out for. And and you remember in the the, the meeting that we had at the lead up to Hamer Hall, I'm just sitting there going, right, Zach, you who has no familiarity with these students' faces, would you mind looking out for these kids yeah, at Hamer Hall? Me, you just gave me a hit list of all the kids yep. that were, you know, had sort of stories that were developing. And we were sort of trying to, whenever we saw them, we'd just sort of focus on them and see if yeah. any interesting things would play out yeah. and that was yeah looking back on that now it's kind of funny seeing all the work that you did up until that point and then you've just trusted me with a sheet of paper being like yeah go yeah is he the- no that's not him things that's not him <laughs> yeah and there's yeah there's, you can see like there's light like yeah big swarms of kids just coming into the hall and i'm trying to you know find the ones that we're after. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was- But like hats off to you for doing that because like, you know, that that that's like finding a needle in a haystack. You yeah. know, there's there's a lot of kids to, to sift through. And well, we had plenty of time to do it too. We had- the, We did have plenty of time. Day. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think, I think the main one was just like, right, Zach, keep an eye on these three groups, you know? And then like, and to my surprise, I'm so glad that nothing overlapped in that we didn't miss anything. Um, yeah, it's somehow because, like, for example, we could be on stage filming the junior choir dress rehearsal, and senior stage could have been in the in the back wings doing stuff that we could have missed. But somehow, through the schedule of the day, none of that actually happened. They all had their own schedules and timings mm. that just somehow fit in perfectly with what we needed. And so, again, that's just like the filmmaking gods being on our side. I think it's. It's kind of stupid looking back because I think the film that you've created, I sat there in the cinema Tuesday night and it was a legitimate film and a film that would, yeah, typically involve probably like a crew of hundreds of people, I'm guessing. Yep. Um, and you've done this basically by yourself. Like I I feel bad saying that I helped out because, you know, it was pretty minimal no. effort that I put in. No. Um, and we also had your dad along that night of the concert to help film yep. during the performance as well. Yep. Um, but, yeah, aside from that, it was all your work, which I found incredible. But sitting there, it was a, a complete movie, and I, I loved it. It's even more, I think it's super interesting that I feel like it typically wouldn't be. I mentioned this at the, the review session we had a couple of months back when I saw a preview of the, the doc just so I could help you out with some feedback. Mm. Um, we went with, we're at the ACC headquarters with um, Pat, Paddy and Dom mm. um, just to sort of 
steer the ship into the final direction for the the final what mm. would become the final version. And that was a very rough cut, by the way. Yeah. It was like forty six minutes. So, um, I forgot where I was going with this. Sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> um, something about the build up to it. Um, mm. reviewing the footage. Mm. Ruin the film. Oh, yeah, just seeing the the complete film. Something that would be that would take you know a full crew to do it, then you've done it by yourself. I think, I mean, just hats off to you. It's you did, you've done a monumental thing. Oh, thank you, man. That that <laughs> I really do appreciate that. And so I just wanted to ask you, what was it like when we went to the cinemas on last Tuesday night to premiere the film with your friends and? family and staff that were mm. part of the film as well. I, man, the, the weeks leading up to it was just um, really provocative to the brain and really provocative to my well-being. Unfortunately, I think it was just like, it was just a, I can't, I can't really say I was nervous Actually, no. Yes, I was nervous. Yeah, um, you were but pretty it's, nervous. It was. It was a, a a large component of that is because my deadline was unfortunately brought forward by nearly two weeks. So losing fourteen days of crucial editing time because um, the cinema had some technical requirements that meant they needed the film to be converted in a particular yeah, file that's, format. Uh, that's not an easy job. That no. Following very specific requirements, yeah. that is not a yeah two seconds. But job. it meant that the film needed to be done earlier to give them leeway to work mm. on that converting process and to meet those requirements on time. So, um, so that was a bit of a punch in the gut <laughs> for me um, because you know there I was having having planned out my my calendar according to leading up to the cinema viewing. And then all of a sudden, I've like 14 days have just been <laughs> removed from that. And so, uh, but again, you know, I couldn't be, I couldn't be moping around all day long. I had to get down and just do it. So uh, I think for that last, that last month, I think I worked on the film every day, including weekends. Um, there was, and having to juggle client work on top of that as well, that just a nightmare. But, um, but then eventually leading and look, I, I think in hindsight, it actually works better that I got it done, you know, two weeks before we screen it because it doesn't make any sense to still be working on it the night before and hitting yeah. the render button and just like, you know, shit hits the fan if and something then goes probably wrong. Probably watching it then and be like, oh, I could make yeah. a change here. And, and you know what was great is because because I've been working on it every day, I finished it. 12 days before the screening and handed it over. And I chose not to watch it for that entire time, which to me felt like an eternity like to be step to having stepped away from it for two weeks. It just felt ages. And so it was actually strange. I got to sit down and watch it in the cinema almost as like an audience member. Like I obviously knew what was coming up, but it was just nice to see it with fresh eyes and in a, in a completely different medium, which is this, theatre with a fantastic sound system and a big screen. And, you know, we chatted briefly afterwards, but to echo what we were talking about, I don't know what they did, but somehow that screen made it look like this film was shot on Ari mm -hmm. Alexas. And even though it was just these small Sony cinema, uh, sorry, Sony alpha cameras, but it looked really good up there. Um, well, that's also hats off to you, mate, because I don't know how you make your footage look so good, honestly. <laughs> and even though you don't, you know, dive into all this fancy cinematic color grading, but just all your footage, I feel like it just has a really, it's just all super clean and just looks amazing. And like we use the same gear essentially. Yeah. I don't know how you do it, but anyway. Oh, look, you know, that's, that's where the, that's where the 10 years, you know, that's, that's <laughs> just where that comes in and, and, it, and it gives you a little helping hand. But, um, but yeah, yeah in, ter in terms of like, yeah, how I was feeling and, for the cinema yeah, sitting in that the cinema watching your film yeah what I, was that like so um i was actually i was nervous the day before but ironically enough i had an acc shoot which was with all the music directors there 
And so I think part of my apprehension leading up to this moment of showing the film was that I was also going to reunite with all these people again after not having seen them for a year, but I'd spent six months editing them on my screen. And it was just like, it's that thing of you're so used to seeing them in this one context that I'm now about to meet them all again in a completely new Oh, these are real platform. people, that's right. And they say yeah. more than these yes. a couple of sentences. And to be honest, through the process of making this film, I've almost become a bit more of a fan of these people. So I'm now like geeking out. Well, yeah, like, I felt uh, the same because after yeah. our review session a couple of months ago, seeing these people show up to this premiere event, I'm like, hey, I know these people. I know, these yeah, are movie stars. That's it, exactly. So, um, so what? Are, yeah. So basically, I got to meet all these guys again at this shoot, which I then think it took the edge off the following day because throughout the day I was actually really surprisingly calm. Got up, took the dog for a walk. I got to work on some other client projects. I did some shopping. I was actually very relaxed, and then get to the event was still pretty chilled. You were pretty chill when I rocked up. Yeah, so I was actually okay, and then. Then maybe there was like 15 minutes or 20 minutes leading up to the actual screening itself and then the heart starting to go and all that beautiful catering that we had, I really didn't get to have any of it because my appetite was just mm. gone. Um, I wasn't nauseous, but I knew if I ate one more uh, one more meat pie, <laughs> it would have been all over. So the Steven Spielberg uh, incident would have definitely taken place. I actually did think about that. Like, I wonder if that's ever going to happen at any point because- you know, this is like the big moment now, you know, a year and a half work and it is leading up to this night. And how many people that were there, uh, you know. I think uh, 30, 40 people. You know, yeah. is it, it was a, it's an intimate screening. It was a small theatre. I but, know, to me that's huge, especially yeah. sitting in the cinema, everyone just staring at that screen. Yeah. So how I felt watching the film itself after sitting down, uh, I... To be honest, I could not relax. My heart was this the whole time. And I, I'm I'm sitting there trying to incorporate breathing exercises just to get my heart down. <laughs> I'm in my nose, out my mouth. But my out my mouth was <laughs> it was oh, I just couldn't I really wanted to sit and enjoy the experience. And look, I was able to, but um it, yeah, it was it was a bit difficult, but what I cared more about was making sure that everyone else was enjoying themselves. It's at, at the end of the day, it's not how I feel. It's how they feel about it. You know, I am so conditioned to this movie, but I need to remember that these guys are not, they're seeing it for the very first time, fresh eyes. You're seeing it in a, a new form for the second time, but in a completely different format. I, I would hope. I don't know what you did in those six weeks, but you uh, really ramped it up. Oh, good. Like okay, it cool. Just all came together. So well, like yeah. I, I, yeah, I enjoyed that whole night. I was just sitting there loving it. Great. Oh man, that just like <laughs> that's all I wanted to know. Yeah, like honestly, and I think everyone felt the same way. Yeah, everyone's reactions to it afterwards mm. were everyone was pumped about it. Mm. One thing I do want to bring up though, because it, it it was a very special moment, was that I made a very conscious uh, a conscious choice to sit next to my grandfather. Yeah. Um, you know, grandparents are not around forever. And so, uh, and I have a really great relationship with him and to be able to sit there and when the first credit popped up, he just grabbed my hand and leaned over and said, brilliant, absolutely brilliant work. And it's just like, that's a memory that I will now cherish forever. Um, that's beautiful. So it's, it was, and my grandmother embarrassing me, giving me a standing ovation halfway through the film. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. It's, it's not, not done, done yet. yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what you get out of, <laughs> out of them. And look, yeah, it, it was just lovely to experience that evening with, you know, with family and with friends that had been supporting me through this journey uh, as well. You know, they had been hearing about it, you know, intermittently over time and they'd been asking about it as well. You know, how's the film going? And, um, and to for them to finally be there and actually see what I was talking about. You know, my my best mate, he was there. Um, he, he was very nice and he gave me a little uh, a gift bag as well. And, and, and he's been trying so hard to kind of understand what it was that I was going through and stressing about. And 
then he sent me a message after the premiere. It's just like, okay, I get it now, man. I I I, I never fully realized what it was that. You I were undertaking. I didn't understand you until I watched that movie, and then yeah. I understand where all your time and energy has been. Yeah. So um, it was just nice to be at it because I think the problem with doing something solo, like yeah, you were you were part of that experience with me, and, I, and I'm so glad that we get to have that shared experience in one way or another. But um, when it in terms of the overall project scope. There was no one that I could really turn to to be like, give a high five. We made that from start to finish. This is where I go back to like that whole film school thing and the necessities of having a crew. A big learning curve that I've walked away from this experience is the importance of having crew, not from a delegating point of view, like for people to just pick up the load, I'm talking about it from the point of view of sharing a wonderful experience with people that you care about, that you love, but also you have the same passion f- for making movies for. And to be able to to have that satisfaction of sitting there in a theatre and going, we did that. We are so proud. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a bittersweet moment that I was experiencing because there was like... There, w- there wasn't really an opportunity to have that with with anyone who who had been there from the very start with me through to the end. And so now I get to walk away from that and go, okay, for the next one, I'm going to invest in more people to partner up with and to collaborate with on projects that I can uh, be more selfless and uh, less selfish about and like giving up certain things that I would prefer to have control over because I am a perfectionist. Um, that was part part of the reason why, you know, I prefer to do this, you know, on my own. But you, what do they say, you know, uh, faster alone, further together? Yeah. I think that's just really important to maintain. And uh, sometimes it takes having to go through a project with such longevity attached to it to then eventually realise once you're at the finish line, um you know, it's like when you win the Oscar and then somehow you get home and you're still, like, there's still something empty in there. You realise that that accolade hasn't fulfilled you, you know. So this movie does not at all, like, I don't, I haven't arrived at the finish line. It's like, yeah, I can die happy, you know. This is just the start. Just the taste for what's to come. Absolutely. So, um, and again, I loop it back to what a, like, it couldn't be more symbolic that it's with the ACC, you know, and what a joy it was to be up the front receiving questions from the very man who basically gave me my career. Um, and and also another great loop to that is that this is also Paddy's last year at the ACC after 19 years of service. So I just thought I couldn't have asked for a better gift to give back to him than a, a, a feature-length film that encapsulates all of his hard work from, you know, conception through to the final product, which is the the concert itself, plus all of the sporting events and the art and technology stuff that he also has to juggle as well on top of that. So, I don't know, just everything about this experience was just so perfect in how it all came together and... I couldn't have asked for a better night. It was that premiere was really enjoyable, despite how I was feeling prior to it and and throughout it as well. But uh, yeah, I'm 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 stoked with how it turned out. And also, um, what's really important to mention is you know there's a there's a call to action for for this movie as well. You know, we're covering a concert here, but um, the film features uh, a woman named Dr. Anita Collins who breaks down all of the uh, benefits that music has when you start incorporating it into your routine at a young age um, when it comes to uh, personal growth, brain development, uh, you know, cognitive uh, behavioral uh, manners that slowly become more fine-tuned over time and how you can apply all of those techniques in other situations in your life. So you could practice music at a young age, but you don't have to necessarily 
pursue music as your career, but all of the techniques that you learned when practicing an instrument and playing in a band, it may be hard to believe, but when you look at scientific and psychological neurological research, there's actually a lot of indirect benefits that you take away that you can apply to mathematics, to architecture, to literature, to uh, solving equations, etc. And so the film is a piece of entertainment, first and foremost, but it's also an informative piece as well. And it, 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 uh, it encourages parents, teachers, and indeed the students themselves to keep pursuing their music journey, even when the going gets tough, but that's all part of the process. And so, um, you know, if this movie remains a piece of entertainment, I'm fine with that. If you can manage to achieve that, and on top of it, it's then it then um, creates a conversation. That's even better. Um, well, I think that it's yeah. super important to note. It's so much more than just a film to recap the concert. It mm. really is a legitimate story with real topics and and values and takeaways that we're that you're trying to deliver with it mm. and at the end of the film I, I honestly did like i really felt something after it too so i mean that's excellent indicator that it's a great film rather than just watching and being entertained by it you know i really felt a strong sense of like this is uh there's a real big purpose behind this mm. and it's a real strong message that really means something so cool Thank you, you, man. You did an incredible job with it, man. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I can't uh, walk away from uh, this experience and not acknowledge your part in it. And because you still played a very strong role, because at the end of the day, like all those rehearsals, without you, they are nowhere near in the in the in the quality that they currently are. You know, the because like for those who don't know, we only had two run-throughs on Hamer Hall to get as many tight shots as possible, and that was it. And so, and then I somehow had to weave that all into the actual show itself, and that was a it was a struggle. But had you not been there, there's no way that was going to be possible. And because of that, this is going to make me look good on camera. I have a gift for you. You have a gift for me. Which is... How unexpected. What the hell? <clears throat> you get to take... One of these home, really, because your logo is very much earned its place yeah, down the there, and uh, yeah, you you do form a part of this project as well. And so this is me saying thank you for your uh, contribution to it. Amazing, thank yeah. you so much. No, of course, that's awesome. So, uh, just everything about this project, I love so much. <laughs> cool. Well, yes. Not that I really had anything to do with it, but it's. Uh, yeah, just the work you've done on it and just the the care, the dedication, the patience with it. Mm. I think yeah, a lot of patience. It's all, all paid off. Mm. I think now you're on to move on to bigger and better things, having your first feature under your belt. Yeah, well, you know, I was asked that question at the premiere, you know, what's your next project? And uh, Have you figured out an answer yet? Well, right now I'm working on Mission Impossible 8, uh, sorry, what I would be working on or what I am working on, <laughs> uh, but, um, there honestly isn't anything in the pipeline, but, and I've told this to you before, after having that experience and having the thrill of that enjoyment, I now have a thirst and a drive for working on more feature length stuff. Um, it's kind of like that aha moment, like, oh, now I... Now I know what why all these directors like don't work on episodic television shows mm. and they only want to make movies. Like I get it now. Um and so Well yeah, once you've been working on something for so long, you really just get a full grasp of what it's like. Yeah. So I now look <sighs> I have to probably put in some more work on my end to figure out what the next story is gonna be. Um I can't necessarily just rely on someone to like to wait on someone to give me the call. Um, and so, but it just goes to show if I'm going to pick something, I better bloody enjoy working on it because it's a year and a half that you're devoting on one project. And, um, you know, some of those, 
some of those shorts that I made at film college, you know, I wasn't passionate about those stories. And so I wasn't feeling that enjoyment working on them. And the best part about those endeavors was when they were over <laughs> and I got to have my free time back. So whereas this, as taxing as it was in post-production, um, I could sit there in the theater feeling very satisfied that I had jumped that humongous hurdle of just needing to get it done and having to write on the fly, but in the form of editing, you know, configure those storylines um, while hitting writer's block so many times. And like, yeah, there were mo like part of the reason why it took so long to edit was because there were seasons where I actually wasn't editing at all. I had to step away from it in order for me to come back to it, look at it with fresh eyes uh, because there was, pulling my hair out and wanting to flip my desk, you know, this is just, I have to call Patty, like, this, it's not going to work. So I'm so need, sorry. Just it's just like, wait, it just wait it out a bit and yeah. get a bit more different perspective. And he wasn't helping, so how is that, it's, uh, how's that film coming yeah, along, you know? Missed uh, organisation, Patty McKenna. Shut up, mate. <laughs> deadline, deadline, deadline. Oh, yeah, look, and uh, I actually had another, um, I was going to bring up another thought as well in terms of, like shooting was really fun all except for two moments. I did. I forgot to mention the second moment. The second moment was, um, it was the fourth rehearsal and I got really sick. I was so ill and this is at the, the peak of COVID testing by this point. And so the rats are just like, you know, nonstop. Um, but then again, rat tests, they weren't really reliable. And so, I rat tested that morning. It came up negative. I was still a bit iffy about it. I had to make this choice in a, a half an hour period. Do I go or do I stay home and potentially miss a whole bunch of crucial story moments? Um, and I decided to bite the bullet and go. And I was dying there. And... Um, and then to rub the salt in the wound, um, Patty calls me halfway through the drive there and to say, oh, I've just caught COVID. I'm, I'm taking the day off. And I'm just like, oh, if he's staying home, <laughs> what should I be doing? I'm like halfway through the drive. And then I, I, I got so ill to the point where I actually admitted myself into hospital like a day later. And I was there for the weekend, but I forced myself to like- get better quick because then the following Monday after I was discharged, I had another rehearsal to film as well. So I just had this like forced hibernation sabbatical where like maybe like the project was just getting to me so much and the, 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 um, the having to be constantly mobile day after day after day that I, that was probably burnout. And I just had to slump in a hospital bed with an IV in my arm and then and then but that was my recharge take a breath and then by yeah by monday i was right as rain to get back to film the fifth rehearsal but i like i don't have any regrets on going and hopefully didn't get anyone sick i was masked up but um I think it all worked well, out. Well, yeah. So, like, well, yeah, what I'm trying to say is I went along and, like, there were moments that are in the movie purely because I did show up. Yeah. And so... And uh, especially solo operator, you don't really have much of a choice. Well, no, and I, and I contacted... I don't know if I contacted you. I can't remember. But I think I, I, had, I reached out to some people, like, can you do this last minute? But then, then the tricky thing there is that they're going to shoot it in a way that- You need someone who understands the story and what's going on and yeah. Yeah. So all all, all, those, all those elements formed part of the reason as to why I ended up going. Well, I think um, you made the right decision. Oh, yeah. The, it was worth it. <laughs> even though worth Even it. though I was about to fall over it and yeah. Anyway, so- nah, but yeah. Done, done an amazing job. Thank you, man. Where can people find the film? Yep, so the film is going to be released uh, on the ACC and the Creed Media YouTube channel on October 6th at 6pm. Um, the school's 
really fortunate to hear that the schools are actually going to be planning their own in-house viewings as well, um, which is amazing because, you know, the student, you know, the premiere, I should mention, was a, a staff adult-centric viewing. No students actually came along because that was just going to be a nightmare. So the students are yet to see this, and so they're going to uh, play it in um, – at assemblies or just form their own little uh, uh, celebration event. Um, but yeah, but then after that takes place in the first week of term four, we will then uh, publicly release it uh, on YouTube on October 6th. So, Which I'll link down below so we can all go check it out. Please do. We want as many people to see this. We're not going down the festival route for many reasons, but um, and so we're, we're choosing the YouTube route because, uh, you know, People are watching feature lengths on YouTube nowadays as well. It's you know, just more accessible. It's more accessible, and uh, it's 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 an underrated platform, I think, and an underappreciated platform. Um, and I think we need to we need to catch up with reality that you know YouTube doesn't have to be viewed necessarily on a computer or a phone screen. You know, you can link videos to your television now and still watch it like a movie in your home theater. So, um, uh, yeah. We just want everyone to see it. Please go see Accent on Music, the documentary film, on October 6th. Amazing. Well, Curse, I think that we can wrap up here. Is there anything else that you want to share? I'm going to (laughs) sleep. I think that's, yeah, you definitely should, man. You've been working bloody hard for the last, well, couple of weeks in particular, just trying to get the the film done and just Mm. all the stress of this premiere. But the movie's done. You've done a fantastic job. and. I just wanted to say that I really respect you as a filmmaker. I think you're awesome. I always love coming to jobs with you or just taking your place so I can just help you out in any way I can. And I know that you're destined to great things and this documentary that you've made is just a, it just shows that. Oh man, I really appreciate the kind words and, and the, nothing but likewise to you, man. And uh, like, it should never go un- uh, unacknowledged that uh, I, I love what you're doing now in pursuing this this new chapter of uh, wanting to really um, pursue excellence in in uh, videography and the podcasting as well. And you've just accomplished the 100 reels in 100 days. That's really tough to do. I don't think I can keep up that regime for that long. And uh, I'm really excited to see where you go uh, next. And uh, especially, you know, with, with plans to travel around the world as well. I can't wait to see uh, what comes into fruition there. But uh, yeah, and it's an honor to be your second guest on your podcast. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where that goes, as well as the back to co- back to the college stuff as well. And, you know, I've watched a couple of your episodes there and you've met some really fascinating people over that time. So, uh, yeah, no, it's – the feeling is mute. <laughs> you're, you're an absolute legend. Thanks, mate. No worries. Thank you. Curtis Reader, everybody. Thanks, guys.